What's good kings and queens? I hope everyone's week is going well. This week's video is on when boxers get taken to school. If you're new to this series, this video displays a boxer completely outclassing their opponent using brilliant fundamentals. With that being said, let's start the video. This matchup really came out of nowhere, as many were expecting a potential lightweight unification against lineal champion Jorge Linares. We get a fight with Broner instead. This is Mikey's first fight at junior welterweight, and despite Broner's experience above lightweight, Mikey still came in the slight favorite to win over Broner. Broner was at plus 250. Despite those odds, Broner on paper was a force for the lightweight to deal with. Though Broner had the clear speed advantage, Mikey swept through him thanks to superb timing, consistently being first with his shots when Broner was being hesitant, but not overstaying his welcome to be countered. Great usage of effective aggression. Ultimately, Garcia was able to sweep Broner on the scorecards to win by a wide unanimous decision. Joshua learned from his mistakes from the last match with Ruiz, and that was not to fight a man with T-Rex arms in comparison despite having one of the longest reaches in heavyweight history on the inside. I don't think anyone took Joshua's words for it coming in camp for the rematch. Joshua stating he's going to fight like Ali. Well, it certainly was not like Ali, but he definitely outboxed and outclassed Ruiz to win by almost a shutout on the scorecards to regain the heavyweight titles. One of the biggest fights to end the 2020 year off, as it was on New Year's Eve. Kosei Tanaka was aiming to be one of the youngest and certainly the fastest to become a four division champion and his 16th pro bout and finally cracked the pound for pound rankings. Ioka, who is a former unified champion, four division champion and current WBO super flyweight champion, he as well is fighting for pound for pound, though he should have been in the rankings at one point in his career. Both guys, if they win, have plans unifying against the winner of Estrada Gonzalez 2 the following year. The fight was incredibly competitive, but there was one a huge exploit in Tanaka's defense. He has had a bad habit of dropping both hands before leading with a shot, resulting for him to get hit. Ioka, who is a brilliant inside fighter, knew this right away, and the first real time this happened, Ioka drops Tanaka at the end of the fifth round. I can only assume Tanaka was told to keep his hands up, but if it was a bad habit, and if it was never corrected, that's simply not going to happen for him to correct it in the middle of the fight. Towards the final minute of the sixth round, Tanaka once again dropped by the same counter. Despite putting in great work in the seventh round, clearly winning it, unless he was able to hurt Ioka, you can just sense this happening again. And in the eighth round, around the same time in the sixth, Ioka catches Tanaka once again, and this time it was for good. The ref stopped the fight as Tanaka was out on his feet. Ritmo de pelea bastante más calmado, mientras que Tanaka todos sus combates son frenéticos de principio a fin. Oh! Y se acabó. Ioka successfully defends his title for the second time, and as of a couple months ago, finally enters Ring Magazine top 10 pound for pound. To add on, that was actually a brilliant stoppage by the ref, because Tanaka had a great 7th round, and the 8th was good as well. You may say he was winning the 8th. He stopped the fight soon as that punch landed, and the ref literally had to catch him as he briefly lost consciousness. This was Golovkin's pay-per-view debut against IBF middleweight champion David Lemieux. This was the first fight in a while viewers saw Golovkin put on a boxing clinic, displaying brilliant defense, evading all of David's shots. Gennady could not miss with the jab that night. That was the most effective weapon of the fight, completely taking David off his game. Golovkin would knock Lemieux down in the fifth round, and depending on how David reacted, it could have very well ended up as a disqualification. 
не в пользу Мангуста. Оп. Вот так вот. Только очко не снимайте. Он бил уже пап во время движения да. вниз. Тяжелый нокдаун. Конец раунда. Будет ли добивать Головкин? But luckily, it didn't, and Gennady, after more of a brilliant boxing display, ends up stopping Lemieux in the eighth round. So Ray Mercer in his previous fight successfully defended his title against the favorite Tommy Morrison, knocking him out in the fifth round. Mercer's next mandatory opponent was undefeated Michael Moore. I'm only assuming since the fact that Holmes, who was 42 by the way, was on a five win streak after the Tyson fight and looked decent. He was offered more money to fight the old legend over fighting a former light heavyweight champion in his first title fight in the weight class. Mercer vacated the WBO title to fight Holmes. Holmes came in as a 4-1 underdog. Despite Mercer having his moments, the 42-year-old Holmes shocked everyone, outsmarting, out-hustling the younger, much stronger fighter round by round, reminding Mercer that he should have kept that belt and defended against Moore instead. Holmes will win by unanimous decision, though one judge had it close on the scorecards. Two of the judges scored at 117 for Holmes. As stated in the previous installment, the boxing media really likes to rule out Hawkins in a fight. Despite going on a long record-breaking spree of title defenses after beating the favorite Tito Trinidad, Hawkins will lose two highly contested fights against Jermaine Taylor. And now, according to the media, he's reduced to pre-Trinidad Hopkins and was ruled out having a chance against Antonio Tarver. Hopkins completely shuts out Tarver, becomes a light heavyweight champion, beats Winky Wright, loses an incredibly close decision to the great Joe Calzaghe, and right back to pre-Trinidad Hopkins media mindset coming into the Pavlik fight. Pavlik was a 4-1 favorite to win. At that time, I had only been watching boxing since mid to late 06. This was the first fight I saw live on stream where I saw a boxing lesson of this magnitude. Yeah, live stream. It existed back then. Back in those days, links were exchanged in the DMs of boxing forums, sometimes to a streaming website, mostly a specific address you had to use in a live stream program called Sopcast, clean 360 to 480p with no internet lag. Yep, those were the days before the clout chasing new generation throwing everything out there publicly, promoting live streams and ruining a great system for us school kids and less fortunate to enjoy some pay per view boxing. Oh, the, yeah, the, the fight. So yeah, once again, Hopkins shut out the boxing media and, and completely takes Pavlik to school to win by a wide, wide margin. One judge actually had Pavlik total 106 points. That will have to mean that Pavlik one round was outclassed so bad that the judge scored the round 10-8 in Hopkins' favor. He's still ripping Pavlik in domination and putting him on the defensive. Crowd loves it. Damaging blow to the image of the younger generation. After Tony's nail-biting rivalry against Mike McCallum, he moved up to super middleweight. He had one fight at super middle, and his next fight was against IBF super middleweight champion, Iran Barkley. Tony from the beginning, and Tony catches him inside with counter lefts and rights. Barkley trying to go to the body, Tony coming right up the middle, and James Tony is giving better than he's getting. This is the best James Tony one we'll see. If you wanted to show a friend who never seen a James Tony fight, this is the fight to show. 168 pound fight. There's a good right uppercut. Right hand, numb your legs. You saw the best of his offense and defense. Just so much talent from the 24 year old. Barkley was ultimately stopped in the ninth round. Just keep hitting on the punch. Catch this guy leaning and grab him. Good on James Tony. And the 32 don't look as good on Barkley. Left hooks from Tony. Barkley is stunned again. And Iran just can't defend himself against the 
As explained in one of my videos regarding this fight, the history of the super middleweight division up to that time was mainly ruled by fighters across the pond in Europe. You saw the best guys fighting the best that defined a whole decade. American media did not report it at all, just like the cruiserweight division. Downplay and underrate the fighters there when the US has no one at that time to bring forward to the table. When Jeff Lacey was coming along, despite him just coming into the super middleweight scene, picking up a belt, he was immediately put on that pedestal. They was calling him the super middleweight Mike Tyson, and the media was clowning the long reigning champ, Joe Calzaghe, not giving him a chance to win. It was an easy pick, and virtually, I would say 95% of the US media picked Jeff Lacey to win and expected him, fully expected him, to knock out Joe Calzaghe. Joe was actually injured just before the fight, and his dad reminded him how much he needs this fight, how much the media has belittled him, and this is his night to shut them up. Joe fought like a man possessed. We're talking about Hajime no Ippo, green eyes possessed from round 1 to round 12. Lacey was being completely outclassed, and to top it off, Calzaghe knocks Lacey down for the first time in his career in round 12, and finishes the fight on the highest note. I I was right, <laughs> with effing of course. You're right! I told you so, I told you so. And we kissed each other. On this list, we saw all levels of boxing lessons. But out of all of these, at least they looked like they had some sort of game plan. Birdo and the Mayweather fight, I've never seen someone so clueless what to do in the ring. Dude was like Ricky Bobby when he first got interviewed after winning, and was like, what do I do with these hands? I'm not sure what to do with my hands. Like, this dude did not know what to do with them hands. When watching Floyd fights live on TV is like watching Champions League football. You're watching the best play the best, and no matter how good one team is, you're always on high alert to expect the unexpected, no matter what the matchup is. Dang. With this fight, this is simply just league play against a team that's about to get regulated to another league. And on top of that, this is when boxers get taken to school part 2. For more installments, be sure to like, share, and if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to my Patreon for Patreon-backed projects and early access. I'm Alfa Sancho, and I'm out.